Um, good evening. Welcome all to the IRSS, IR seminar series of Bilkent University's Department of International Relations. Today, we have a very distinguished guest, um, Dr. Omar Tashpinar. Uh, he lives in Washington, DC. He teaches at United States National War College and Johns Hopkins University, SAIS. And he's also a fellow at the Brookings Institution. Let me just summarize Dr. Tashpinar's long CV in a very short paragraph. Dr. Tashpinar is a professor at the National Defense University and non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He is also an adjunct professor at the Johns Hopkins University, SAIS, School of Advanced International Studies. His areas of expertise include Turkish-American relations, the European Union, the Middle East, Muslims in Europe, political Islam, and Kurdish nationalism. In addition to several short publications and scholarly articles, he is the author of three books. First, Kurdish Nationalism and Political Islam, Kemalist Identity in Transition in 2005 from Routledge Press. Second, Winning Turkey, How the EU and the US Can Restore a Fading Partnership with Phil Gordon, Brookings Press, 2008. And third, What the West is Getting Wrong About the Middle East, IB Taurus, it came this year and it has a very unusual argument about uh, uh, political Islam and international relations. Hojam, thank you very much for being here. Today our topic is obviously the US elections and we would like to hear your remarks. Thank you, Özgür. Thank you very much. And let me try to summarize uh, what's going on in uh, Washington DC. Uh, after the elections, but also uh, why this election is a historic election for the United States. First of all, uh, uh, anyone who's familiar with uh, US politics in the last four years can uh, say that uh, we had an unusual uh, president. The president of the uh, country who was elected in 2016 uh, was a uh, self-described describer, uh, uh, outsider to the system. And in fact, he was uh, someone who uh, uh, galvanized the kind of nationalist uh, frustration in the United States with globalization. He galvanized in many ways the, uh, the uh, issue of you know, uh, too much globalization, too much political correctness, maybe uh, too much uh, sensitivity about America's place in the world. He led a very populist campaign summarize with make America great again and America first. So in a nutshell, this was a kind of nationalist uh, president who was frustrated with globalization, who was frustrated with the fact that the whole world was uh, taking advantage uh, of the United States. And he had unusually good relations with Russia. Uh, he had unusually uh, good relations with authoritarian governments. Uh, by temperamentally, he's someone who sees himself as a CEO, uh, as someone who is a, uh, first of all, a business leader, and he likes to take care of business. He has a book called The Art of the Deal. So he sees himself as someone who would basically engage in a one-on-one -on -one negotiation with strong leaders like uh, Putin or uh, Xi Jinping, or even the leader of North Korea, according to uh, Trump, he had a love re relationship with the leader of North, North Korea. So he's attracted to power. So not, not coincidentally, he had also a good relationship with Tayyip Erdogan, who uh, is himself also uh, 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 someone who admires power, who likes to take care of business and who likes to have one-on-one -on -one, uh, CEO to CEO relations. So the big question for the United States uh, was uh, now that we have someone like Trump, who is uh, someone who is very unusual, populist, authoritarian, uh, very dismissive of the press. He coined the term fake news for everything, and he waged a war against the media establishment, especially Washington Post, New York Times, and, the, and CNN. And even with Fox News, his relationship was kind of love and hate. Anything that was against him, he would describe as fake news. So the big concern in the United States was whether the institutions would be able to uh, withhold such a president, whether the institutions would be able to survive, uh, whether we have the institutional maturity in the United States to, to have a president like that, uh, because the big 
issue is, of course, whether, uh, you know, when you have such a president, uh, can the checks and balances work? Uh, what kind of uh, uh, system would apply? Does the rule of law apply? And uh, I, I, I think overall American institutions managed to survive Trump, but barely. If he was elected, if he's elected a second time, I think institutions have been eroded here. The, the Department of Justice, the justice system, the media, we have seen a constant erosion of the uh, institutional power of the United States. But overall, I think uh, we can say that the media, uh, the rule of law, uh, the bureaucracy, uh, the separation of powers, legislative uh, uh, body, Congress, uh, these, the system has worked. Uh, uh, and overall, I think, uh, because Americans vote based on economic issues, had it not been for the pandemic, had it not been for COVID-19, I think people would have voted for Trump again because the economy was doing rather well under, under Trump. Uh, and I'm not saying just the stock exchange, the stock exchange was doing really well, but overall wages started to increase under Trump. Ta he, he lowered the taxes, so the private sector growth was uh, significant. Uh, employment really reached very high levels. Historically, the United States reached a kind of natural level of unemployment around 3.5. And most importantly, during the Obama years, during the Obama years, we had a recovery of the economy, but there was wage stagnation. So wages started to increase too. This is why uh, Trump pr can claim that he has done wonders for the American economy, especially the blue collar voters who were behind him did rather well. And even the African-American community, he keeps saying that Amer African-Americans, Blacks in the United States never had uh, such a good president, that he's the, he's the president who has done the most for African-Americans since Abraham Lincoln. And he has, the only logic for saying that is that actually African-American income per capita and African-American uh, uh, unemployment uh, uh, figures uh, uh, went in the right direction. Unemployment went down and income uh, was uh, growing. But then the pandemic came and the pandemic changed many things. First of all, America entered a recession, a major recession. And then the country became really polarized. Wearing a mask turned into a statement. Uh, so he started to dismiss some of the experts. He picked up a major uh, trade war with China before the pandemic. The trade war turned into really a major uh, problem for America's relations with China. So there was fear that, you know, uh, we would end up with a kind of decoupling of the Chinese economy from the American economy. So even the business community started to worry. And the last year in that sense has been a year when Trump's popularity started to, to, to decline with the economy. And this is why we entered an election season, which was extremely polarizing. And it would have been even more polarizing had the Democrats nominated as their in their primary someone like Bernie Sanders, for instance, because even in the absence of Bernie Sanders, who would, couldn't win the primaries, even with a kind of establishment person that Trump derided as Sleepy Joe, uh, as someone who is basically uh, very much part of the establishment, paradoxically, Trump also managed to portray Biden as the agent of socialism, the agent of chaos, the agent of communism. And what I can say is that uh, this portrayal of Biden as a socialist, Biden as someone who will defund the police, Biden as someone who's basically uh, will have this green new deal that will end American capitalism and end oil based economy and will bring basically environmental standards all over uh, uh, was about fear mongering. It was about fear mongering, but it worked with certain communities. The country was, in addition to a health crisis, was also in crisis because of a race crisis. The, what happened with the, uh, uh, with the George Floyd uh, saga uh, was unprecedented in terms of what happened to a uh, black uh, uh, young man who was killed basically brutally uh, with the knee uh, on, on his neck of a police force really ignited the energy of uh, the African-American community and the issue of Black Lives Matter gained really unprecedented momentum. So not only we had a pandemic crisis, we also had a 
uh, uh, race crisis, racial crisis, which further polarized the country. And then in the debates, uh, Trump uh, with uh, Biden uh, failed to condemn white supremacy. He basically uh, was very ambiguous about his position on, the, on these kind of racist groups like Proud Boys, for instance. And he told them to stand by and stand down, which ignited the conspiracy that he is really a white supremacist. I don't think Trump is a white supremacist, but the opposition started to see him as a racist guy, which meant polarization was off the roof before, the, before these elections. And everyone started to get worried. And all this, as if all this is not enough, Trump failed to uh, assure people that we will have a peaceful transition of power, that he will accept the legitimacy of the elections. Uh, he basically failed to convince people that these elections will be fair. He said the only way the opposition will win is, is if they rig the elections. So you can understand why we entered elections in a very polarized environment. And then uh, election day came uh, and uh, we now have a situation where it looks like uh, the mail-in voting will determine the result of the election. So Americans have, first of all, the most important thing, have participated to this election at an unprecedented level. The turnout is the highest turnout in American history. And despite the pandemic, people have reached such, such turnout because of mail-in voting. About 100 million people voted before the elections. So more people voted before the elections than during the day of elections. How come? Because of the mail-in voting. And it takes time to count this voting. So in states like Pennsylvania right now, what we're seeing is that until uh, tomorrow uh, evening, the vote uh, that is arriving with the mail will still be counted. So it may take uh, a couple more days for Pennsylvania to finalize its results. And uh, there are other states where the mailing voting is still being counted. And uh, what we can say about the polls is that the polls were right uh, in seeing that in Southern states, in Southern red states like Texas, Arizona, uh, New Mexico, Nevada, we can see a uh, more purple color, that the blue uh, 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 of the Democratic Party is making significant gains, especially in suburbia. And that's exactly what happened. Texas became, became competitive. In Arizona, right now, uh, Biden is still ahead. In Georgia, it's very close to call. In Nevada, uh, Biden is ahead. So I think the polls were right in seeing that there is a Latino community and there is a suburban community that is increasingly voting now for the Democratic Party. Uh, what they did not probably counter the votes, what they did not realize, uh, the pollsters, is that in the, no in the northern states, in the Midwest, in places like Wisconsin, in places like Ohio uh, or uh, 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 Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, the polls were unable to really register the white blue color, uh, relatively uneducated, without a university degree vote. It's very difficult for pollsters to reach someone on a landline when that person is not at home. So they, they could not really reach that lower middle class, less educated white voters who still had uh, a lot of tendency to vote for Biden. And the same people voted uh, the day of going to the ballot box. So the first days, the first um, hours of the election, we, we saw in places like Michigan, Wisconsin, Ohio, uh, a huge uh, Republican turnout. But then the blue shift came with the mail-in voting. And uh, we are seeing now, even in Pennsylvania, that there is a blue shift taking place. Americans have these nice sound bites for these terms. There is the red mirage at the beginning, and then it turns into a blue shift. So the red mirage is turning into a blue shift right now, and Trump is doing what everyone expected would do, which uh, is to say these elections are rigged. Uh, they, they're counting votes that did not exist. We will challenge the court. We will challenge the election results. We will take it to the court. I expect that they will try to challenge the results. Whenever it's very close, they will ask for a recount. They may try to take the issue of the counting of the mail-in vote in places like Pennsylvania to the Supreme Court. Uh, but overall, my hunch, and I will close with this, is that Biden uh, has done really well in these elections. Uh, he has basically taken 
southern states inimaginable to take, such as Arizona, very close in Georgia, uh, very uh, Nevada, and in Pennsylvania, the difference was 700,000 yesterday. Now it's around 100,000. So the blue shift is happening. If he wins, if he wins in Pennsylvania, if Biden takes Pennsylvania, he has the luxury of losing Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia. So everything right now is focused on Pennsylvania. And we're in for a kind of difficult 48 hours. Everyone is looking at Trump, what he's tweeting, what he's saying. Biden is acting as a very responsible man. He did not declare victory. Uh, he says uh, he's confident that he will win, but he's not polarizing. And in the streets, I was in the White House. I was in front of the White House giving interviews yesterday. I didn't see any violence. People are tense, but uh, I don't see many Trump supporters around, maybe because I'm in Washington, D.C. If, if, uh, if Trump does what uh, a populist politician would do, which is uh, to call his supporters to the streets, then we're in trouble. I'm not sure how much supporters he has, but I'm sure that there will be some fringe groups that may go to the streets and not in Washington DC, but in the Midwest or in Texas, or I don't know, uh, in places like Oregon, Minnesota, there can be some potential violence. That's what I'm afraid of. And I hope uh, we, won't, we won't get there. Let me stop here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to talk about the elections, but this is where we are. Thank you very much, Ojam, for this wonderful summary. Um, I'd like to start with the questions from the floor. I'd like to continue with the questions. Um, Selim. Well, Ojam, first of all, uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, my question uh, would be about the uh, foreign policy uh, issues. Uh, if we assume that the Biden uh, won the election uh, and elected as the president, uh, in that case, do you expect a more uh, idealist or let's say cooperative, collaborative uh, foreign policy, uh, like the continuum of uh, the so-called Obama doctrine? Or do you expect uh, some sort of uh, real politic, uh, the practical uh, foreign policy? So what I expect from the Biden administration, if there is one, uh, if there's a Biden administration, which I think there will be, is to continue more or less as the Obama administration did. So engagement with the world, return of America uh, to uh, the United Nations uh, Global Climate uh, Paris uh, climate, uh, climate Agreement, the return of America to NATO as a responsible NATO ally, uh, more problems with Russia, uh, he will definitely put a distance between the United States and autocratic leaders. So he will talk more about democratic alliances. Uh, uh, therefore, all the privileged relations that uh, Trump has established with authoritarian leaders, ranging from uh, uh, Putin to Mohammed bin Salman, from Sisi to Erdogan, there will be a review of these relationships. There will be more of an emphasis on the need to uh, show uh, more moral leadership, the fact that America should be in favor of at least paying lip service to the idea of uh, good governance and democratic rule, rule of law. You can see the kind of moral leadership of the United States uh, restored. In fact, the term that the Biden administration is using for itself and its supporters is the, is a, it's, it's gonna be a restorationist administration, uh, whereas, the more uh, progressive wing of the Democratic Party under the leadership of Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, for instance, were in favor of a renovationist American foreign policy. Renovationist would have been a more isolationist, in my opinion, foreign policy. Uh, for instance, the United States would not be engaged in being really the, the, the uh, global, global uh, policeman in, of the world. And uh, the idea that, you know, we have too much problems at home. We should focus on the environmental issues at home, the governance problem at home, the racial problem at home, the incoming disparity at home. That would have been the Bernie Sanders administration or Elizabeth Warren administration. With with uh, with Biden, we have a more. Uh, you use the term collaborationist or idealist. I would say a more pro-globalization, pro-American leadership, pro-America's. Uh, 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 role as a global leader uh, uh, in, in, in the world. And that takes really uh, the issue of American-Chinese relations to
to the to the heart of the issue. On America and China, I think we have really entered a great power rivalry period. So Obama was much more willing to look at China and adopt a policy of engagement with China. Uh, and I think the Biden administration is a little bit more realpolitik oriented with China. They know that China is a rising power and it's an ambitious power and it wants to have a sphere of influence in the South China Sea. That's the big problem. Is America going to accept a Chinese sphere of influence in the South China Sea? And the question is, what do we mean by sphere of influence? If the sphere of influence means uh, building islands, bullying all the countries in the region and uh, threatening Taiwan with an invasion, I think the Biden administration will say no. Uh, there has to be uh, some uh, rules-based international order. Uh, so he, that they will push for uh, what I think is this kind of rules-based idea that, there, the Amer that China should be a country that abide, abides by the sovereignty of other countries, that it cannot uh, force itself, both uh, on, especially on military issues, as uh, a, a country that will, by force, establish a sphere of influence. Uh, on the economy, I think Biden is quite nationalist too. He's a mercantilist. So when you look at his economic policies, I think he may continue some of the policies that Trump has adopted and use it as leverage with China. Instead of saying, yes, we're in favor of free trade, uh, he may continue some of the tough language of trade negotiations with China. So he will not be as engagement oriented as Obama. He will be a little bit also in favor of containment and engagement. So more, more balance in terms of the need to strike the right balance in terms of engagement versus containment of China. On Iran, a Biden administration will come back to the nuclear deal. They, they will try to renegotiate the nuclear deal and they will try to bring this time some additional arrangements which will address the ballistic missile issue, not just the nuclear issue, but Iran's uh, more conventional military activities and Iran's support for Hezbollah, Hamas and other terrorist organizations, including the militias in Iraq. So there will be a return to diplomacy with, with uh, Iran but it will be a clear-eyed, uh, uh, realist approach to Iran, which will take into consideration the problems that were integral to the JCPOA, which was the old uh, nuclear agreement. So I expect Biden to be a little bit tougher than Obama when it comes to uh, the Iranian diplomacy. The real issue, the real test will become with Saudi Arabia, with Turkey, with uh, North Korea, uh, on these issues, uh, I think Biden will try to have a transactional relationship. He will go to Erdogan, and we'll talk more about this maybe in a different question, but he will, he will demand certain things. He will say, look, I'm, I'm not here to fight. I'm not here to uh, have a confrontational approach, but here are the things that you have to do for us to have a better relationship. I think he will go the, to the same way with the Saudis. He will ask certain responsibilities for, he will ask for, to assume responsibility uh, from Mohammed bin Salman for, for issues like the war in Yemen, the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi. All these issues will come back to the table. So there will be a, a less tolerant American administration towards authoritarian regimes, even if these authoritarian regimes are uh, allies. Egypt, for instance, on the issue of Egyptian human rights, on the, on the declaration of the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization, I, I don't think Biden will accept the, the, the Egyptian portrayal of the Muslim Brotherhood as a terrorist organization as a given. Uh, he will say, look, you need to figure out a way to bring some level of uh, freedom of speech, some level of representation of uh, uh, the conservative people, political Islam, etc. So I expect him to be a little bit more confrontational with these authoritarian governments. Great, um, Madeline. Hi, thank you again. Um, I have a domestic politics question. Um, I'm wondering what you think about if there will be enough time for either um, campaign's legal team to take a case to the Supreme Court because 
relatively speaking, between now and January, it's not a lot of time. So, yeah. I, I think they need to have a case. What is the case that they will take to the Supreme Court is the big question. The Supreme Court just uh, days before the election uh, decided that the vote in Pennsylvania can be counted until three days after the election. So uh, they may say, they may try to take the case to the Supreme Court and again saying that they should review that decision, that uh, votes should have been counted the day of the election only, that they should not allow ballots to be opened, mail-in ballots three days after the election. So for instance, that would mean a certain percentage of the votes in Pennsylvania should not be looked at, uh, should, not, should be considered not and, not and void. So uh, that could be one way of challenging the result. Uh, another one, if the vote is too close in Nevada, if the vote is too close in Arizona or Georgia, they may ask for a recount, just like it happened in Florida uh, in 2002 in 2000, sorry, between Bush and Al Gore. So there may be a recount in Georgia, there may be a recount in Arizona or Nevada or Pennsylvania. And usually recounts do not take for weeks. It may take, you know, five, six days. So there is enough time. In all the articles that uh, I've read about what could go wrong between election day and inauguration, which is January 20, a lot can go wrong. Uh, you can have basically the president of the United States argue that he didn't lose that election. He may refuse to concede. He may say they stole this election. We know it. Uh, fake news is behind them. So he may declare the illegitimacy of the electoral result. In that case, we need adults in the room. And adults in the room will be the leaders of the Republican Party, the senatorial leadership, the Republican Party itself, who would basically try to speak truth to power. They would try to go to Trump and say, Mr. President, you had a legal case. The, the courts have decided the following. After the courts decided that you, the election result is that Biden won, you, you, you don't have the right to take the country to chaos. By declaring, by tweets that the, the election was rigged, you're inciting people to violence. And you should stop this. I hope the Republican leaders, uh, uh, McConnell or the congressional leadership, or I don't know, elders who, who basically have supported Trump because they thought he was gonna win, will realize that he lost. The reason why I think Trump was so popular within the Republican party is because the Republican party was winning with Trump. Now that the Republican Party is no longer winning with Trump, I hope the pragmatic people within the Republican Party will tell Trump that it's time to stop polarizing the country. Okay, um, sounds a little optimistic, Ojam. <laughs> but let's hope so. It's optimistic uh, if you don't think that the election is legitimate. I think if the courts decide that the election is legitimate, then uh, he will be in a position where uh, he can no longer pretend that he, he, this election was stolen. He can pretend it, but the base, which is always like, a, I think a shrinking base and Fox News, it depends, it, a lot depends on Fox News too. If Fox News fuels the kind of uh, uh, propaganda that the election was stolen, uh, that may polarize the country. But I think sooner or later, there will have to be a reaction. By the way, if there is demonstrations in the streets, et cetera, the stock exchange would fall. And, and Trump is always looking at the stock exchange and the economy. And the Republican party is looking at the economy too. So I'm a little bit optimistic, a little bit more optimistic than the doomsday scenario of uh, Trump having to be ex escorted from the White House, the inauguration day by the secret police. I heard that too. Um, Khan? Uh, thank you, Professor Tashmar, for your talk. I actually want to piggyback on Madeline's question and ask a more broad question in that regard. So you talked about how the system worked uh, despite weathering the storm, and we've seen how the Trump administration has barreled through a Supreme Court justice just two months, I think, before the election. Um, even if uh, Trump leaves office, what do you think the implications of this uh, Supreme Court nomination and the six to three conservative majority on the Supreme Court will be in the term going forward? 
presumably Democrats govern term. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, a lot depends on what kind of decisions the Supreme Court will take on, on uh, the electoral result. If the Supreme Court turns into a very political court, for instance, if between now and the inauguration, they pass laws that tackle uh, Affordable Care Act, Care Act, uh, which basically, uh, uh, which is Obamacare. If they tackle laws regarding abortion, if they tackle laws regarding the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, uh, if they play a major role in determining the electoral result, uh, these would prove that the court has become extremely political. I think there is still room to say that despite this 63 conservative majority, the court is a court that looks at every case by its merit. These are professional uh, uh, judges. Uh, yes, they may have conservative or progressive views, but in my opinion, uh, it's too early to say the only way you can challenge this kind of partisanship is to uh, pack the court with more numbers, to take the number from 9 to 11 or 9 to 15. I don't think Biden wants to do that. Even if he wins uh, in a landslide with the Electoral College, I don't think he wants to really uh, use what I would think would be a nuclear option to say, you know, we're going to add five more seats to the Supreme Court and we will nominate all these new judges. That would open the uh, pave the road for Republicans to do the same when they come to power once again. Where are we going to end up with 30 Supreme Court judges, 40? Which number is the final number? So uh, I, I think overall what will happen is that there will be a serious debate in the United States after these elections about the electoral college system. Because twice in a row we're seeing now uh, a potential situation where you can win by millions, 3 million, 4 million, 5 million, the electoral vote, the, the popular vote, but you can still lose the election. Uh, that's how Hillary Clinton lost. So uh, if uh, uh, the current trends continue, what we're seeing is that a state like Texas, a state like Arizona, these southern states, which used to be red bastions, are turning increasingly purple and potentially blue. Texas demographics is changing. The Southern demographics is changing. So I expect a serious debate in the United States about the future of the electoral, electoral college uh, and uh, also about uh, redistricting and uh, gerrymandering. Uh, all these uh, issues that mean that congressional politics, uh, district redistricting or uh, the, the, the too much power in the hands of state legislatures will have to be challenged. Uh, the, Demo the Republican Party is a party that is losing the demographics of the United States. The demographics of the United States is increasingly looking more diverse with more immigration, more Latinos, more minorities, younger people. So there has to be a way to reflect this changing American demographics to, uh, to power, to the representation of the United States. And the Electoral College is increasingly looking like a, a, uh, a system that doesn't allow a fair representation of the people. Uh, if you have a state like Montana, which has you know, uh, 400,000, 500,000 people with two senators uh, and a certain number of electoral college, uh, and people in California, people in New York should be able to say, we need a different system. So the institutional change that I expect in the United States is more about the soul, soul searching of the electoral college and this redistricting issue. Eda? Thank you. Uh, my question uh, is about the nature of electoral victory. Um, maybe it's too early to say, but it doesn't look like, regardless, who, regardless of who is going to win, it doesn't look like a, it's going to be a landslide victory. So um, do you think um, there might be, that might um, cause a, a potential division within the foreign policy decision-making unit in the future? Do you think a gridlock is likely? Because even if Biden wins, um, will he have enough uh, room to maneuver um, to change foreign policy decisions? Uh, there may not be a landslide, but I think there will be a clear Biden victory, especially if he wins uh, Pennsylvania. And then uh, one of the 
following Nevada, Georgia, or, or, or Arizona, there will be a clear victory. In fact, there is also a chance that he may end up winning uh, Nevada, Georgia, Arizona, and then Pennsylvania. Then we have a clear landslide. In any case, we're talking about electoral college here. I think it's already clear when you look at the, uh, the popular vote that uh, participation is around 70%. And Biden is likely to win these elections with five or six million more people that have, who have voted for him. That, in my way, in my way of analyzing elections, when you have when you win six million votes more than your opponent, uh, that's and, and then the electoral college, and then you win the Senate, you already have the House of Representatives. Uh, you, you have a lot of power. So I don't see really a, 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 a government will, will, which will say, we don't have a mandate. They will have a mandate. They will have a very strong mandate. So I don't expect really, uh, especially on an issue like foreign policy to have divisions. This will be a government, this will be an administration uh, that will uh, basically see that it has a mandate that wants to bring uh, uh, American foreign policy and American domestic politics to a very different level. As I said, it's a restorationist government. It will restore in foreign policy, America's leadership. It will change the way America is approaching Russia. It will change America is approaching some of the authoritarian governments. It will have a lot of people who would think about multilateralism instead of unilateralism and rules-based international order rather than nationalism, uh, my way or the highway or engagement with the United Nations. On the environmental issue, this administration is very ambitious. I would recommend to all of you to look at their environmental program very carefully. They're serious about uh, ending fracking, ending an oil-based uh, system, phasing out from oil. The environmental issue is very strong for the Democratic Party. Now, does that mean polarization will end? No. There will be polarization. The Republican Party will uh, kick and scream. They will res resist. But I think the, the country is moving really towards a backlash against Trump. The country is moving towards a situation where in a year from now, we may be talking about really a pendulum swing from uh, conservative nationalism, isolationism, nativism to progressivism, globalism, and America's engagement with the world. And in that sense, uh, I don't think this will be a paralyzed government. Uh, we will have to wait and see what's going to happen in the next few days. Uh, but uh, with the Senate looking like it's, uh, 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 it's changing, I haven't checked the latest, but uh, I, I think if, if, the, if Biden wins, uh, the, the, the Senate majority will also turn uh, uh, democratic because there are already a couple of senatorial seats that are changing. And even if it's a 50-50 situation, the vice president will uh, be counting in some decisions and it will be a 51 to 50 scenarios whenever it's 50 50. So I'm optimistic that the Senate will also turn democratic. House of Representatives is already democratic. The only way uh, you will have uh, a kind of conservative establishment still around will be the Supreme Court. And uh, there are limits to how much you can take everything to the Supreme Court. And a Supreme Court totally out of sync with public opinion in the United States, a Supreme Court totally out of sync with uh, congressional dynamics, political dynamics will, will not be a very, uh, I don't know, a very feasible scenario for the Supreme Court either. On issues like abortion, for instance, I think the country has moved on. On issues like gay marriage, the country has moved on. I don't expect the Supreme Court to bring these kind of conservative issues uh, and to litigate over that. Uh, uh, and I, that, in that sense, I, I think the progressive moment is coming back to American politics once again. Ali Arslan? Uh, Hujam, uh, my question is on uh, voter behavior. So, um, as you said, there have been moments where um, Trump, uh, Trump's popularity decreased. Um, but the underlying problems um, that brought him to power are not fully solved for. Uh, so the question is then, uh, why did the US citizens uh, supported Biden instead of another 
a populist candidate against their current populist leader. Uh, you may say that our people just want to, um, to uh, have some normal leaders, but uh, why? Why, why, why would they want to have normal leaders? I mean, this is not the case in all countries. Uh, some citizens in some other countries seeing that their populist leaders failing issues after issues still support their uh, populist leaders. And when you ask them, why are you doing so? They say that, oh, there is no alternative like the president we have. We have right now, they say. So they, they look for a populist leader. Why wasn't that the case for US? This is the question. So they already elected a populist leader. Trump got elected, but again, the, the underlying causes of 2016, the fact that America elected a populist leader, we may be also sometimes overanalyzing. Uh, um, uh, Trump has won by winning uh, three, in three states with 70,000 words, uh, 70,000 votes. I repeat, he won in 2016 by winning in three states by 70,000 votes. He lost by 3 million to Hillary Clinton to a very polarizing figure like Hillary Clinton. So the idea that you know Trump represents uh, uh, a, a, a certain view of America that is racist, that is very, very you know, angry with the blacks or very nationalist, I take it with a grain of salt. I think the Republican party had a kind of populist moment and they, they will end up uh, resorting to some of the old Republican uh, playbook by uh, toning down this polarization tactic. Trump was a very unusual politician. And the country has learned a lot from what happens when you have this kind of an unusual population uh, politician. The interesting part of your question, Ali, to me is why the Democrats have not voted for Bernie Sanders? Why Bernie Sanders was not the candidate? I think uh, America is not ready for a politician, even the Democratic Party is not ready for a politician that uh, talks about socialism. Uh, socialism, uh, democratic socialism was the biggest mistake that Bernie Sanders made in terms of defining himself. He could have easily defined himself as someone who is for social democracy instead of using the term socialism. I think the reason why uh, he talked about socialism and the reason why the young people got excited about this kind of socialist agenda, although what he calls socialism would look like a normal welfare state in Europe, uh, a kind of normal uh, social democracy. The reason why he, uh, uh, he I mean, the, the fact that he made socialism such a big part of his image and agenda gave the opportunity to Trump to portray the Democratic Party as a socialist party. And that allowed him to win in Florida. He, he won in Florida because a certain segment of uh, the Latino community, mostly Cuban Americans, saw, saw in socialism a return to policies with Cuba that would mean legitimizing the Cuban government. And uh, so that galvanized the kind of anti-communistic, uh, uh, anti-socialist, uh, knee-jerk reaction of a certain community. So he played that game really well. I think Biden represents a view that uh, is still quite populist. Biden is a populist too. Look at his economic policies. I mean, he's basically saying all the right things when it comes to now China. Uh, he's saying, no, we will continue some of the sanctions. We will, we're, we're not going to turn to business as usual. But he uh, also wants to have strong relations with unions. He wants to, he's not a free trader. He's not talking about free trade all the time. Uh, so uh, Biden has his own kind of populism. Uh, so in that sense, populism, uh, you know, uh, can be a toxic force, a polarizing, a poisonous force, or populism can be about finding the right way of connecting with people who feel that they're cheated by globalization who feel that they, they're, they're not really part of this winning uh, globaliz globalizing cosmopolitan elites. Biden is capable, I think, of uh, connecting with uh, the losers of globalization in a way that Hillary Clinton was not. And Biden is also able to connect with the cosmopolitan coastal elites 
because uh, he, he, he can play this game with them too. And he has a lot of people who are in both worlds. So uh, in that sense, I, I think uh, we are at a period when uh, there will be still populism, but a different type of populism in the United States. Volkan Imamoğlu. Hello. Uh, first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question regarding Fox News. You already mentioned Fox News as one of two polarizing effects in the United States, but I think one of the interesting things on the election night and that they have called Arizona before CNN and other, and other networks and now and, and Trump is furious about this. So do you think that this, this shows that uh, some conservative base is already abandoning Trump or just uh, you know a fight between Murdoch or Trump? How do you interpret this? I personally would not read too much into uh, the timing of what the Fox News is doing. Fox News represents, uh, in many ways, uh, views that uh, are Republican and which are in power. Whoever is in power from the Republican Party, uh, I think Fox News will basically uh, represent this kind of conservative populist uh, viewpoint. The bigger question, rather than Fox News, is where is the Republican Party going? After Trump, will there be uh, ideas associated with Trump still uh, favorable within the Republican circles? And a lot depends on how Trump digest, digests the next few days. First of all, if Trump wins, I think the Fox News will not change. Fox News will be as supportive of Trump. If Trump loses, then there will be probably a new Republican Party. The Republican Party will have to do a lot of soul searching about what went wrong with Trump. Why did they support Trump? What is happening to the Trumpian agenda? Uh, whether the things that Trump represents in America are structural, really structural. What does he represent in America? That's, that should be the question. What does the Trump worldview represent? And there's a, there's a chance, there's a risk that the Republican party may overthink this and think that you know, America has really become a white, populist, angry, nationalistic, anti-globalization country. And that would be the wrong conclusion. I, I, I don't think because 70,000 people voted in Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, or Pennsylvania more for Trump that than uh, Hillary Clinton that all of a sudden that means you have this kind of angry white majority in America. We, we, we tend to read a little bit too much into the structural factors that have created Trump. The real structural factor that I think the Republican Party should focus on is income disparity in the United States. We have a, in many ways a crisis in the United States when it comes to uh, income disparity and uh, the fact that this country among the G8 countries has the worst uh, child mortality, the worst healthcare standards, uh, the, uh, the uh, very high mortality rate for people, uh, uh, the, the, the racial issue. These are real problems that the Republican Party should think of. To me, as an analyst, I would spend a lot of time thinking uh, the aftershocks of 2008 financial crisis. If there's one structural factor that is important for American populism, is this debate about globalization versus nationalism, or how much room we should have for the private sector, how much room we should have room for regulation, how much room we should have market fundamentalism or a more uh, restrained capitalism. Uh, these are big debates and the Republican party will have to position itself. What happened in 2008 was a great depression and the worst capital uh, crisis for financial capitalism since the great depression. So there has to be some thinking about unrestrained role of money and finance in American politics. There has to be some serious thinking, soul searching about uh, taxation, taxation policies, a welfare state versus really uh, a state that doesn't provide anything in terms of childcare or or health or you know, pensions. Uh, there is also a fiscal crisis in the United States right now. I mean, America is going through a fiscal uh, uh, problem because the country is heavily indebted. 
So unless we return to growth, there is a growing mushrooming public debt to GDP ratio. The Republican Party should think more about these issues rather than Fox News. Right. Um, I think we are coming uh, to the end of the talk. Like we have like 10 minutes left. So I think I saw two hands before Ahmed Algurum and Ushul Idrisoglu, if I'm not mistaken. If you guys are still here and if you still want to ask a question, Ahmed, would you like to go on first? Uh, thank you, Jam. Uh, I, I think uh, Umar Uja answered my question already. Maybe he has an answer of it. But if you want, I can ask uh, again. Uh, I can ask my question. No, if it's all right. Uh, if it's already answered, that's okay. Okay, okay. Thank you. All right. Ushu, did you have a question? Uh, I had a question. And Umar Uja also a bit talked about it, but maybe he can analyze it a bit further. So we expect Joe Biden to be a leader with more democratic expectations in foreign relations. And I wonder if this has a real drastic observable change in US-Turkey relations. And thank you for your remarks. Thank you for that question, Ishul. That's the question I was waiting for, the Tur Turkish-American relations. Okay, so uh, here's what I think. What I think. I think uh, we're back to a period when uh, the United States will uh, have a distant relationship with uh, Erdogan. Uh, I think Obama, in his last four years, grew increasingly disillusioned with Erdogan. There was a time when they had good relations, but uh, the president of Turkey, Mr. Erdogan, got used to being able to call uh, the White House and, first of all, receive someone on the phone immediately, almost immediately. Second, uh, he got used to having some leverage, inexplicable leverage with, with President Trump. Uh, the fact that today the Turkish economy has not faced major sanctions coming from CATSA, the Countering American Trade uh, uh, Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, which is Russia-oriented sanctions because of the S-400, is simply because of Trump. Without Trump, there would have been strong sanctions. He tried hard to stop Congress, he, he managed to, uh, to uh, win the, 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 the debate uh, and told the uh, Republican leadership to uh, go easy on, on Erdogan. And the dynamics, however, under a Biden administration would mean that uh, both the House and Senate could act very quickly on the sanctions. And there won't be a president of the United States that Erdogan will be able to call or there won't be a president of the United States that can stop this, or that will want to stop this. Because I think Biden's reaction to Erdogan is, Erdogan uh, understands only from actually showing some leverage. And we need to show some leverage. Otherwise, uh, he will continue what he will continue to do. Uh, in that sense, uh, the only way we can have a reset in Turkish-American relations, which I think uh, the Erdogan entourage and Erdogan himself are getting ready for, they, they're talking about a reset, will be a transactional framework. It will have to be transactional. There won't be a reset for the sake of a reset. Trump will prove that, uh, Biden will prove that he's not Erdogan. Uh, that he's, uh, Biden will prove that he's not Trump by talking to Erdogan, by saying, uh, look, uh, if you want a reset, here are the conditions. And conditions number one, condition number one is you will not activate the S-400 missile defense. You will declare that this missile defense uh, will be uh, uh, somehow uh, 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 shelved or returned or boxed or uh, deactivated. The S-400 is our red line. If you do what we want on the S-400, which is deactivation or shelving or putting it back to a box, then you're back in the F-35 program. You can buy the F-35s and we can talk about Patriots, how to make it more feasible financially for Turkey. We can even maybe consider some technology sharing down the line, co-production or technology sharing. It will be problematic, but I think Biden is likely to show some flexibility if Turkey 
says S400s are shelled. We're not going to use it. So it will be much more difficult for Erdogan to maintain the same level of relationship with Putin and Russia uh, in case I think he shelves the S400s. Putin will realize that Turkey is vulnerable to the pressure coming from Washington and that Turkey is turning more towards a NATO direction because Biden has come to power. That will cause problems in Turkey's relations with Russia. And if I'm Biden, that's exactly what I want. I want to create problems in Turkey's relations with Russia. And those of you who are experts on now uh, international relations, you're all students of international relations, you know as well as, well as I do that the Turkish-Russian relationship is a very strange relationship. Ankara and Moscow disagree on almost all issues of re, uh, strategic significance. Can you name one uh, area where An uh, Ankara and Moscow see eye to eye strategically in our neighborhood? Do we agree on Syria? Do we agree on Libya? Do we agree on Eastern Mediterranean? Do we agree on Ukraine? Do we agree on uh, Nagorno-Karabakh? Do we agree on the Muslim Brotherhood, on Israel? The only ar arena where we agree on is Venezuela, Maduro. We don't like Maduro, they, they, they don't like Maduro, that's fine. But that doesn't create a strategic partnership. My point is that Turkish-Russian uh, relations are vulnerable. They're vulnerable. They're, it's a relationship between two men, Putin and Erdogan, and energy, Turkey's dependence on energy, and uh, tourism. Yes, there is tourism, there's economic exchange, but exchanges. But I think if I'm Biden, I'm trying to create a wedge. I would try to create a wedge between Turkey and Russia and use the S400, S400 issue as a, a, as, a, uh, a le as leverage. Now, uh, you asked the question on democratization in Turkey. Uh, I think Biden will be willing when he vis visits Turkey or he comes to Turkey or the, the State Department, the new Secretary of State, they will be willing to talk to the opposition. They will be willing to talk to opposition journalists. Biden did that. He did that when he came to Turkey in 2016 after the failed coup. He had a table where he had opposition journalists. That in itself will send a signal. Turkey's relationship with the United States is a, uh, is a strange relationship. You know, on the one hand, uh, anti-Americanism pays off in Turkey because it's nationalism and a sense that, you know, you can show you're not subservient you're more independent. On the other hand, it can also hurt you uh, because you don't want to project the image of a country constantly fighting with the United States. It may also hurt your economy. It may also hurt the image that you're not very powerful. Uh, so Biden, I think, will use his statements to the New York Times that he said he would support the Kurds, for instance. He said, we should support the Kurdish movement in Turkey. And I think he'll put pressure he will put pressure on Erdogan saying, why is Selahattin Demirtas in jail? Why, why aren't you addressing the Kurdish problem in a democratic way? And he will probably also try to say, look, we have some leverage with the Kurds. The Kurds that we support in Syria, yes, okay, they're PKK. But they want to talk to you. They want to engage in a peace negotiation. Why don't you talk to them? We can put pressure for, on the PKK to disarm them. But to disarm the PKK, you also have to show some willingness to come back to the table. Why would, why would the United States, by the way, arm the PKK? Why is the United States, in your opinion, let me play professor and ask you, why do you think the United States is helping the YPG PYD? Is it because they want a Kurdish state in Syria? Do you think the United States want, want to create a Kurdish state in, in northern Syria? Is that the reason why they're supporting the YPG PYD? In your opinion, well, if the question is to me, I wouldn't think that there's there's a need for Kurdish state in American policy. They rather see Kurdish people as allies in the region, potential allies, but not necessarily as a future state. So exactly, I don't think there is any place for you know we have to create a Kurdish state in Syria or we have to create a Kurdish state in Iraq. The Kurds wanted to establish a state in Iraq. They wanted to declare independence. Remember, in Iraq, the Kurdish regional government had a referendum in 2017. What did the US do? They did not support the Kurdish independence. 
that should normally put to rest all the conspiracy theories that the United States wants to create a Kurdish state. Yet conspiracy theories are not rational. They thrive despite all the lack of evidence of rationality. rationality. I think the only reason why America supported the YPG, uh, uh, PYD, the Kurds in Syria is to fight against ISIS. And if Turkey gets serious about saying, look, we don't want you to support the Kurds, then Biden will say, okay, then let's see the Turkish troops that will fight ISIS. Can you replace the Kurds in the fight against ISIS? That's the kind of negotiation Biden will have. And he has all the people uh, from the Obama administration that are angry with Turkey, like Brett McGurk. These guys are angry with Turkey for supporting jihadist elements in Syria. So he will question Turkey's support for groups like al-Nusra. This is, I think, overall, a new American approach. This will be very different than the Trump administration. On the Kurdish question, on human rights, on Russia, there will be a new voice. Whether it will have leverage with Turkey, whether Erdogan will pay attention, whether he will back off, depends on the state of the Turkish economy. Erdogan right now is not acting like someone who's really you know, uh, in a corner. For some, I, I think he must have some plans about the Turkish economy. At a time when things are falling down, crumbling, he still appears to be confident. I'm not sure what gives him a sense of confidence, but uh, looked, seen from the United States, Turkey is looking increasingly vulnerable on the economic front. And I think the Biden administration will make sure to have some leverage on issues of importance, such as S-400, Turkey's relations with Russia, Turkey's relations with Iran, Turkey's relations uh, uh, with Al-Qaeda and ISIS, and the Kurdish problem. So uh, I expect some change, some change. It's, it's not going to be business as usual. Then I guess, uh, Ömer Hocam, you expect some bumpy flight, right? Özgür Hocam. <laughs> Özgür Hocam, can I, can I say please, something? Please, um, uh, just about, uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, uh, just to you know, support Ömer uh, Hoca's our, our argument, Ömer's argument. I don't know if you heard, but uh, a friend of mine close to Nechivan Barzani just texted me about 20 minutes ago and said that the PKK just hit Peshmerga in KYG, uh, a US-backed petroleum uh, facility. Uh, in Erbil, actually. Uh, and that, I mean, in my mind, definitely crossed the red line. Uh, I don't know how the Biden administration, if and when Biden gets elected, will respond or deal with uh, the PKK, to be honest. Um, but that, that is kind of a game changer because I don't know if you will recall, but yesterday there have been some newspapers, uh, some, some sort of spat in newspapers uh, between the uh, the Kurdish regional government and 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 the PKK back and forth, but today's attack comes with no surprise. I mean, I am surprised because I thought that they would actually not do this, but uh, this happened after you began your talk. So uh, just yeah. wanted to add that. So thank you, thank you, Onur, for that. And I I I, I didn't know, but uh, that that. That proves the point that the United mm -hmm. States is not in the business of supporting the PKK. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, but the United States may have some leverage with the PKK right now. And they may want to use under a Biden administration, if they see signals from Turkey that Turkey wants to come back to a peace process with the Kurds, they may want to use their leverage with the PKK. And they may want to convince Turkey that the American support for the YPG which is, let's, let's admit it, it is the PKK in Syria, is not because the United States wants the PKK to establish a state in Syria. It's to fight ISIS. So if Turkey shows more willingness to fight ISIS, not to, not, if, if Turkey shows that it is not just obsessed with the Kurdish question, but can look at Syria, can look at the region through the angle of, we have a jihadist problem, we have a uh, jihadist terrorism problem too, not just a Kurdish terrorism problem, but also a jihadist terrorism problem. And I know that when I talk about this with my friends in the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they give me all the talking points. They say, you know, more Turks have been killed by ISIS than anywhere else. We have fought ISIS. We have, we've been fighting ISIS, but perception is reality. 
the perception in the Biden administration at CENTCOM, at the Pentagon, the State Department is that Turkey does not say take ISIS as a major existential threat. Turkey always prioritizes the PKK as its existential threat and tends to look at ISIS as a secondary problem that can be solved if we change the regime in Syria. And that's not going to fly with the Biden administration. The minute Turkey starts talking that way, they will say, look, are you serious or not about fighting ISIS? Because we know, we have all the intelligence report that you are actually in bed with jihadist forces in Syria. So let's get serious about what you want to do against ISIS. And then, and also uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, the other group. And then we can find maybe a way to tackle the Kurdish problem, the Kurdish issue together. I don't think the Biden administration will be resorting to the earlier part of the question. Uh, at, uh, at the beginning, there was a question about idealism. I don't think the Biden administration has any ideals about the right for the Kurds to have self-determination, the right for the Kurds to have their own state. I don't think Biden or anyone else in the Biden camp is so idealistic about the Kurdish issue. They know the Kurdish problem is also a democratic problem in Turkey, that it requires more democracy. But if, if they see some willingness on the Turkish part to work with the United States more seriously about uh, uh, ISIS and replace some of the Kurds on the ground with Turkish troops fighting ISIS, I think we have room for a transaction there. Wonderful. Hujam, thank you so much. We are a little over our time and I'm sure you have something else to do next. Um, çok teşekkür ederiz. It was a wonderful talk. Um, we covered a range of topics, I think, and we benefited a lot from this talk. And um, in the future, when this pandemic is over, we would really like to see you in our campus. Excellent. Thank you, Özgür. It's, it was a pleasure and I expect a quid pro quo. You'll come and speak to my class next time. <laughs> All right. Of course. Of course. <laughs> Take care. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Great questions. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you.